like everybody. Um, doing a little bit something a little bit special and different today. It's not about a GW game from the 90s, it's a, about a French company from the 90s and uh, this time we're looking at Confrontation. Um, I've been involved with Confrontation uh, for quite a while back in the time when I gave GW a rest. <laughs> when uh, you know things went from 6th edition and I got out of gaming pretty much altogether uh, for a long period of time until I saw uh, a board game called uh, Hybrid that came out um, probably early 2000s I'd say, probably 2003, 2004 and I was actually introduced through the miniatures before the game came out through another person I knew then and um, that's how I sort of discovered um, the world of confrontation and mainly the miniatures. And it was a, that was during the, I think, the first edition of the game. Uh, this book here is the third edition and probably the most well-known, I'd say, of all the editions that have come out. Uh, there's, there's quite a history behind confrontation and the, the company Rackham, which you might recognize from this sigil here of a dragon, red dragon. And um, uh, they had an incredibly good uh, product line uh, involving many different artists, like um, Paolo Parente was one of their uh, main artists, but they had like the, uh, the incredible talented Paul, um, Paul Bonner doing a lot of their uh, signature pieces for the army box set covers and internal art for a lot of their publications over the years and Paul became a big part of their business actually and probably the lead, lead artist I'd say. Um, quality of their products like I say is uh, second to none. It's um, uh, not only the miniatures, not only were the miniatures really stunning to look at but the quality of all their products and cards and, and rule books and supplements and magazines later on were just the highest out there in the industry. And it was so sad to see them go. And the way they went was really even sadder. But um, uh, I haven't played a game of Confrontation, and not many, I don't think, maybe three or four at the very most. Uh, that was about, about 15 years ago. And I got thinking about it the other day. I've sold most of my collection off to a gentleman over in, um, in Canada. And he's very happy with that because he's like a really devout uh, collector. And I know that um, those pieces that I'd painted uh, will be very much uh, cared for and loved with him in his, ha his home. And uh, with a very, very impressive, well, it's almost like a museum actually that he's got. He's actually got a lot of the uh, uh, scenic pieces and some of the miniatures that were from the studio from that time. So he's really, really into it. and. Um, and I, I was too back in the day, but then sort of things got uh, things changed, and the company went uh, went under into liquidation, and it, the IP has been dragged through the mud ever since. And it's been really sad to see. So um, I think I got back into painting the miniatures about a year ago, and got involved with the Confrontation 3.51 group in Facebook. And there's a great bunch of guys there, really trying to promote the. The game and, and especially the, the miniature uh, painting side of things which is probably the most important aspect and I think it's most famous for the miniatures more than anything else. The game looks really interesting and I really wanted to rediscover uh, Confrontation like I'm sort of in the process of rediscovering a lot of the old games that I played in the 90s from Games Workshop. Uh, this was born in the 90s, um, the, the Confrontation line. so. It effectively is from that uh, time period. I didn't discover it until the 2000s though, but I really want to make a go of it and I really want to bring this game back into, um, into, uh, in, into popularity again, or well, trying to anyway as just only one person, but trying to make videos for it. Um, sort of like, um, I know Ash from Guerrilla Games had done a couple of videos on confrontation because it's one of his all-time favorites uh, from from the time when it was around and he had a really big active community. I didn't have that luxury, I only had myself and uh, maybe one other person, that was Simon. And um, we met through confrontation actually, through the Wargamer AU 
forums, if you remember those, I think they're still around, but we got together through the hybrid board game and that's how we first met. And that's something else, and that's another thing I'd like to get back at some point and rediscover and start playing again. I didn't really give it a good go, and we didn't. We only played a couple of games, me and Simon, so we really didn't get to see the full extent of the rules and to really you know, embrace the game and to put it through its paces and to find out what it's all about. Uh, we only really scratched the surface of it. But um, I'm really interested in, in doing this again. Tomorrow I'm playing a, a live stream game with Owen in, uh, in California. So that'll be starting around about 7 p.m. on the, through the, um, the Confrontation Fanatics Facebook group. So I really look forward to playing it because this is the first time in a long time. So what I've been doing in the meantime is just looking through the rules, just checking uh, how, the, how the process of play and um, the turns work and that kind of thing. Just sort of refreshing myself on how the game's played so I'm not sort of you know, totally lost. Uh, when we start having a game tomorrow. So for this video, I thought I'd just go through some of the armies that we're taking, or two of them, because they're, they're the only ones I've got left. Um, and they're my beloved goblins. Okay. Um, and they sort of worship this rat god. So you can see a lot of, um, especially these uh, clue militamen, uh, really, really nice miniatures, beautifully sculpted, designed. They're some of the most beautifully hand-designed miniatures I've ever seen. And this always, you know, when people think about, you know, 3D, um, like digital sculpting nowadays, I always refer them back to the, the old times of Rackham and how incredibly detailed and beautiful these models were. And they were all done by hand. Um, 3D sculpting doesn't even, you know, touch this, I don't think, for my, for my tastes, anyhow, and my, my opinions, but, um, so these guys, they come in a set of three. Now the, the card, they only got one card, but in the game you could have three cards to activate um, three separate troopers uh, if, you, if you wanted to. But for, for the purpose of this demonstration game we're playing tomorrow, um, I'm only going to have one card. And that's all I've got, unfortunately. Otherwise, I'd like to have three. I like the versatility you can have with the cards. So if you're totally new to confrontation, uh, the cards are sort of your activations. So during the game, you'd have these face down in order. So I've got only three cards here, for example. In this very, very small 200 point game, I'd actually put these into order when I activate them for each round. So for example, this top card will be the first unit that I'll activate in my turn, when it's my turn. And it's all alternating activations too, so I get my I get to play this card and get to move and fight. Uh, well, I get to move with this warrior, um, and then uh, you know my opponent does the same. He flips his card and he activates his warrior, and so on and so forth. You can put these in reserve. So what I could do is is take this card, not show my opponent, and put this into reserve on the side of the board here. So when he's played his turn and it comes to my turn again, I could then take this card and this card and play them both at the same time. Um, that's just a very, very brief and rough look at the activation system, but just in case you're wondering about the cards, what they do and what their role is, that's how it works. And I've always been attracted to games with cards in it anyway, so I quite like this mechanic that they've chosen for, um, for confrontation. Um, but there are some nuances to that as well that I won't get into here because I know I'm not going to get them right. But there's always a tactical role uh, beginning of each each phase, and you'll take the the leader of your group, for example, um, Beg Bunzin. I think the, the the correct way to pronounce his name, Beg Bunzin. Yeah, the strong warrior. He's got a leadership of five. So I would use his leadership, I'll roll a d6 and add that number to it, and the person with the highest uh, will win, and they can then nominate who goes first and who goes second. Um, so there's other, there's other um, elements of the game which make it very different from other games I've ever played. It's all a d6 system, okay, it's a d6 system. Um, 
and basically each warrior, for example, in combat will have two dice allocated to each warrior. And you can have one in an attack and one in defense, or you can have uh, two, in a, two in attack or two in defense, okay? And that's, that's just a very, very simple way of um, looking at how the combat works, but we'll get into that in more detail, maybe in more instructional videos later on if people are interested in learning more about confrontation. Uh, and you'll see the, the live stream tomorrow, I'll upload it to my YouTube channel here. So you can see me and Owen playing it out. Um, I'm gonna test it out myself before we play the game so that I've got some idea of uh, how things work uh, before tomorrow. And it's, everything's measured in, in centimeters, so they have um, these symbols on these cards. So this, I believe, is movement, so they've got a 10 centimeter movement. Uh, the next symbol, I believe, is their initiative. I believe so. Let me check, because I think the symbols are quite confusing. Um, and I think anybody who's first looking at these cards will think the same thing. Yeah, so the second symbol is initiative. The, the third symbol here, uh, the, first, the first number here is your attack, and the second number is the strength, okay? So attack of two, strength of one, okay? The, the following symbol is defense and resilience. Uh, these come into play obviously when you're attacking and you're defending and the damage you sustain during an attack. Uh, the higher resilience and the higher defense, the less chance you'll actually get uh, wounded and uh, suffer, uh, suffer damage. Uh, the following symbol, the one in black that's blacked out is aim, but they don't actually have any missile weapons, so they don't have any stat for that. Uh, the following one is um, courage. So they've got like a, a sort of a bronzy colored uh, circular symbol here in a, in a, in a sort of design of, um, of a black um, kind of thing inside there, which means it's a courage. So they'll make it, they can use that for courage, a courage of one. Being goblins, there, you know, their courage is quite low. They're more prone to be running away. And the last symbol, of course, is discipline. Um, now, I can't, yeah, I think it's discipline. Yeah, it's the strategy role that you make. So for um, for Beck Bumzen, he's got the highest, highest strategy rating. Uh, the Strom Warriors. They're more of your elite, they're goblin elites. Um, they have some better stats than the Kloon Militarmen, thank goodness, because I'll, I'll need something to penetrate the, that dwarf armor when I face them. But as you can see all around, they've got Courage of 3, which is already better. Their, um, their Tactical Discipline is 3, which is quite good. Their Resilience is a lot better, so they've got like 7, because they're wearing heavy armor. Um, and as you can see on the cards, they have like certain abilities as well. Now the abilities are listed in the rule book um, that will give them some kind of special uh, ability, whether it's in attack or defense or during the game. There's something they can do, but I think fanaticism is a, a combat related um, skill. Okay, now the, the militarmen don't actually have any skills. They have an ability which is called Reinforcement. Now, most of the goblins have this Reinforcement ability, which means that basically when they're removed from the game, so for example, I've got three to start off with, but just say that in the in, uh, previous combat, one was um, removed from play. During the maintenance phase, I could roll a dice. And if I rolled a five, which I did in this case, I rolled a four, but if I rolled a five uh, or a six, he would actually come back and I could place him, um, I think, within 10 centimeters of another trooper um, in, the, in, the, um, in the maintenance phase. So that's a really, really powerful thing. So the goblins can keep coming back, being reinforced to strengthen their numbers, to bolster their lines, and it's they're really hard to kill. Now, especially these guys here, these strong warriors have also got the reinforcement ability. Uh, they've got brutal and fanaticism as well. So they're really, really good. I'm, I'm really hoping I can get these guys back. Um, and the way to to improve your, uh, you know, improve the chances or to have 
um, an auto auto reinforcement is to bring this guy, this uh, Beck Bunzen, the Storm Warrior. He's like a character. Now you can have up to 50% of your total points in characters. Uh, this is a 200 point game, so I'm just, actually I might have made an illegal move here because he's gonna be actually over 100 points with his equipment. So hopefully I oh, won't mind and uh, for this game, for a little demonstration game, it should be okay. I can take one of those pieces off. Um, actually, I'll take the sacred nut off. I think that'll, that'll look because I don't actually have it, which I'll talk about in just a second because it's quite a unique little card. But um, as you can see, yeah, his stats are reasonably better than the um, the Strong Warriors. Okay, so um, his initiative is uh, a lot higher, so he's got an initiative six. Um, his other stats are quite higher too, so he's got an attack and strength of seven, which is really high, and his defense and resilience is six and nine. So yeah, he's a bit of a beast, and it's been quite quite hard for Owen to take him down. But I think if we have uh, him facing his other character, then uh, we could see a, a nice little uh, bit of hero hammer because it, it really is. It, it, it does focus on the heroes in confrontation. They do play a massive part and they tend, tend to have like a big backstory um, that you can play in uh, various scenarios that were part of the second edition uh, version of this game. To give you an idea of the Strong Warriors, you can see a lot of um, beautiful detail that have been uh, put into these miniatures and I just love the character that they've achieved in making these models. Um, one, you know, you can sculpt miniatures but to have character in a model is something that is really hard to give. Like you, 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 you give models like these miniatures souls really if you put character into them and to paint them it's just like painting something out of the imagination of Jim Henson. You know, um, uh, the genius mind of Jim Henson. I think that's what I really feel when I when I paint these these goblins, um, and uh, you know I just enjoy doing them so much, so immensely, so that uh, I have some more goblins that I would like to paint to bolster my goblin forces in time. Um, and you'll see those wonderful designs uh, in future future episodes when we do more. Um, battle reports in the future but yeah really really cool stuff uh, now this is uh, Beck Bunsen so I haven't pronouncing that right I don't know how else to pronounce it actually there's such really weird names um, but he's got a really cool the severed head of some kind of uh, wild boar or something on, on top of his helmet it's so such a great model uh, the face details and everything is so incredible uh, the casting of the miniatures back in those days were revolutionary. You know, they were so, so advanced. You know, they were really decades ahead of everybody else in the production of miniatures, in the, in the design of miniatures, in the artistry behind their products. Uh, you know, people, they, they changed the whole industry, really. Uh, and they, you know, you can still see um, the designs, the design influence, especially of, uh, of the Rackham Studio in many companies today. Um, even, you know, look at uh, Age of Sigma. I mean, that's very much, I think, very much influenced from this, this kind of uh, anime style, if you like. Um, very animated, very uh, characterful. Uh, now, the uh, Big Munson carries this uh, mad mace. Okay, so uh, basically it can influence his uh, strength rolls during the game and um, basically I can nominate uh, it's got Mad Mace 2 so basically I've got to roll two dice when I when I use this weapon it's a NAFTA powered weapon um, so it just says the player rolls two an extra sorry an extra dice on his injection rolls and keeps the highest to determine the result of the roll so it's not too bad. So I get to roll two dice, I keep the highest, and then I can add that to my strength. But if you roll a one, something bad happens, okay? And when something bad happens, I've got to roll on this, um, on this table here. And if I roll one, 
it's not good, it's an explosion, and the fighter is killed outright, okay? So it's a bit like Warhammer, you know, the old games of Warhammer where you had these tables and charts that you roll on. Uh, of course, the, the benefit is that, you know, your, your characters become super powerful, and that they can do these uh, wonderful abilities, but on the downside, there's always a downside, I like that, but there's always some kind of chart or something table you need to roll on. Uh, these are for the, the dwarves, but um, apparently this guy rolls on this chart too, uh, because the NAFTA weapons and the steam-powered um, uh, weapons and, and armor that the dwarves use all have this kind of chart associated with it. I could be wrong, and the guys are going to point me out uh, tomorrow if that's the, if that's not the case. But I think that is. So I'll take out the sacred nut. Now these these points at the bottom of the cards you need to add to your character card, your character value. So I normally I'd have to add an extra twenty because of the mace and because of this. I'll take this out because I don't actually have the the uh, the, the seventy mil nut, <laughs> and that's no joke. You need a seventy mil nut in order to, I mean, I'm talking like an aluminium or steel, stainless steel nut, a hex nut, okay, that you would hold above your head and announce, by the power of the sacred nut, when this, uh, and when it's used, you can then bring back two uh, reinforcements uh, automatically, I think. I don't think there's a role, I think you just bring them back. So I've talked to guys about this in the, in the Facebook group, and some of the guys have actually, you know, brought these nuts to their games. It's so hilarious. I think it's wonderful. I love seeing these kind of really quirky rules in games. And it really brings a sense of fun and um, lightheartedness to the, the faction too, which I love. And I love that about Warhammer as well. So I'm really, really pleased to see this rule. And I, I used to work in the fasten industry, so if I did, if I'd known about this rule, I would have asked people if they'd asked for a 70 mil hex nut, and I would have Maybe propose the question, you know, do you play a confrontation, conf confrontation at all? And I probably would have got a few strange looks, but it would have been worth it, I think. But yeah, I wish I got a 70 mil nut now from when I worked there. It would have been a damn sight cheaper. So they're the goblins, and that's what we're going to uh, use tomorrow. Now, I'll be playing the goblins. I've never played goblins before, so this is the first time. So I'm really excited about using them. And, um, and in future, expanding this army. I'm just going to move the rule book out of the way, so I'm not um, sticking my hand to the pages and we're just going to move these models to the side for now so we can have a look at the dwarves and see what, what Owen's taking. Now Owen's an experienced guy, he's, he's been playing uh, Confrontation for a long time so you know his his knowledge of the game is far 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 uh, far reaching more than I than I have and um, that's good I'm, I'm, I'm glad that he can um, he can sort of, you know, lead me along and, uh, you know, show me where or things that I'm doing wrong or give me some kind of strategy advice or whatever during the game. So we've got uh, uh, Karnia, the Savage, I think that's how you pronounce his name, with his Fusion Hammer. Okay, we've got some uh, Core Warriors, put another six on the camera, so the Core Warriors here. They also have another card that's uh, associated with this particular unit and I love these models too. I love the dwarves because they're so chunky and, and the goblins too. Um, there's one slight criticism I'll have about the rack and models is that um, they're so slight and so uh, incredibly thin on the ankles especially on a lot of those miniatures that I think a lot of people found that their ankles would break or snap when they tried to pin the models to the bases and that kind of thing because the metal is quite soft. Oh that's the wrong one. Um, this is a Thermo Warrior. And um, the metal's quite soft, and you would often have a lot of breakage, breakages, um, uh, over extensive use, or just just trying to put the models together. So yeah, they were really only designed for experienced um, model makers. Um, so I think that's why they chose later to go with a um, go with plastic, which is quite sad. And I don't want to go into that because it's. <laughs> It was a pretty sad time uh, during during the time of when Rackham was around, and it ultimately uh, proved their downfall. But here are the dwarves in all their glory, all in their metal glory. So um, I did actually have this painted, this guy kind of painted in a different color scheme. I had him in blue and orange uh, to match the 
the Core Warriors, but I thought authenticity is really my thing now. I really want to make things like they were back in the day and uh, try to match all the studio schemes. Not to say that this is painted as good as the one in the studio, I don't think it is, but I'm happy with how this turned out. And so I did some touches up on it yesterday. Gave him the fusion hammer he deserves, nice and red, and the armor looks red, and I actually quite like it. I've changed a few other colors, like his beard and um, that sort of, uh, some kind of canvas roll or something on his backpack. He's got all kinds of equipment, you know, pickaxes, swords, little keg there for beer, I suppose. He's got some kind of face mask when he's um, maybe down in the mines or in the mountains. Um, and uh, yeah, I really, really, really like this miniature a lot. So I really want to see what he does. Um, now he's got the highest, well actually no, he's got equaled, uh, oh, he's not got the highest strategy. Wow, okay, I didn't know that. I'm just looking at the cars now and he's got a strategy of six, but um, the the dwarf armor has got a seven, so that's interesting. So he's gonna move in a 7.5, initiative three, he's gonna attack of four and strength of seven which is not bad. His uh, defense is five and, and resilience is eight, which is pretty good. Um, and he's got courage of six. So you would expect all the dwarves to be quite courageous, like they're you know, fitting within the, the lore and the theme of dwarves. They're not gonna run away. And um, they're more, uh, more susceptible to things that cause fear and that kind of thing. Well, as in they're, they're less susceptible to those, I should say. Uh, he's got quite a lot of skills. He's got hard boiled, he's got bravery. Um, Pariah, Master Strike level 3, Bane for goblins, so that's not good for my goblins tomorrow. And he's a Dwarf Veteran Champion. Uh, so Owen would have a good uh, good knowledge of those skills and how they, how they interact within the game. I'd say most of them are for combat related uh, skills, so uh, he would know what to do there. So my next, probably my all time favourite um, regular rank and file unit, if I can actually pick up the card, <laughs> uh, without damaging it, it would be nice. Um, oh, and just before I go on to that, uh, I should say that Kanye has got a fusion hammer. We'll just see what that does. You can add an extra 10 points to his carry. He's pretty cheap, it's like only 58 points all up with the fusion hammer. So, it says here, it, when using the fusion hammer, if he managed to make an undef undefended attack so if the person he's attacking doesn't put any dice into it in defense, okay, then, um, oh, so the adversary whose resilience is equal to or less than three, which I believe some of those, maybe the, um, the militiamen uh, have that uh, less than three, I think. Uh, then do not make a damage roll. The victim is automatically killed outright. So it's really powerful. And of course, when when, when models take damage, okay, so just to give you a brief look at these, these uh, counters, they're all still in, the, um, they're still in their pack. Uh, this is a stunned marker. This is a light wound. Um, it's like a medium wound, and that's a uh, serious wound. Uh, these other counters for different other effects as well. But once you start taking wounds, your your, you know, your, your um, resilience and your uh, strength and your initiative, they take penalties. So he could take somebody's resilience down uh, even further, like a, like a strong warrior or uh, Beck Bunzen as well. And he could kill them outright if you can get them under three, but I don't know, you know if that's possible or not. But I would say so for certain other warriors, um, but certainly for the goblins, he's got a good chance. Plus he's got that goblin bane, so maybe that does some kind of um, additional uh, damage to them or something like that, I'm not sure. We'll have to see tomorrow. But yeah, really excited to see how he goes. Okay, so next, Core Warriors, probably my favorite dwarf uh, elite uh, troopers. Um, they've got really good stats too, you know, they've got uh, really good uh, resilience. The toughest is pretty low, but their resilience is quite high. Strength again is not too high, but their um, their strength, the attack, sorry, attack is quite low, but the strength is quite high. Um, now, initiative zero, so that's quite weird. Uh, so they're very, very slow, um, but uh, their strategic value is actually six, which is incredible. Uh, carriage of five, of course. So they've got hard boiled, they're brutal as their abilities, 
scared. They've got two-handed core swords and plate armor. So, you know, they're gonna be slow. They're dwarves anyway, so their initiative's not supposed to be very high normally. So they're very slow, lumbering sort of tanks on legs. But I love the models. I think they're absolutely gorgeous. Uh, I really enjoy painting them. Uh, and I've actually gone over the armor because I got in touch with Martin. Martin's one of the, uh, the former painters at Rackham. And he kindly gave me the recipe that Sebastian used for when he painted them in the uh, in the studio. So I was so happy that he could give me that recipe and I bought the paint for it, which is an orange brown, I believe, with ivory and yellow. That's right, yeah. He mixed yellow in the orange brown and ivory for the highlights. So I was so pleased to get the original color for these dwarves because I love that color of the armor that they use on it. It's I don't think it's as good as what Sebastian did on his miniatures because he, he's just a master uh, with the dwarves that he painted. I'm just amazed that someone actually paint like a hu human hands actually painted those miniatures. They're so beautiful. But I'm, I'm, I'm reasonably happy with mine. And um, yesterday I changed the color of their top knots from that, uh, to, uh, that teal color to green to match, the, to match the studio colors. They need a bit more yellow on them, I think, just to, um, to match the studio colors. But yeah, I'm really happy with them so far and they're my most favorite unit. I've still got another three female core warriors to paint up at some point and I still want to get the original, uh, I think the first or second edition ones. Now the core warriors, they have also, um, yeah, nice little abilities here that you can pay in army points, only two or three points to give them an extra ability. So you can choose one or the other before the game. And I think, uh, I think Owen's going for the Alfax, um, which is a solo guard ability. So you can give it to any core warrior associated with the fortress of Karina. He acquires Master Strike 2. So they all, they all got Master Strike 2 in this game for tomorrow. Um, so that's really nice to have that variation. You've got some options there to, depending what sort of stronghold you want to affiliate your dwarves to, which I really like. I really like those kind of themed um, army styles you can take. So the next one is the Dwarf Armourer, which has a strategic value of seven. So I think I'll oh, be using him as his um, strategist in the initiative roles and that kind of thing. So uh, again, initiative zero, he's in full plate armour too. And I really love these models. I mean, when they first came out, I was so excited to get them. I just couldn't wait. And I ordered um, through Melbourne, might've been Mind Games in Melbourne. They had they had a huge range of Rackham stuff uh, during that time and I ordered it directly through them and just painted them as soon as I got them. I just love those figures. So uh, stat-wise, they're not too bad. They're pretty, you know, they're fairly good. They've got hard-boiled and counter-attack. Now, counter-attack is a really good one. Um, it says what it says. It's, you know, after somebody has attacked, they get to an attack back. Uh, obviously there are some other details to that rule, but you know, they're, they're really good uh, in that regard. I like counter-attack as a, an ability. Uh, now I haven't actually gone through all these abilities. I think they're similar in some ways, but they've got three different options they can take, uh, which they have to pay for in AP as well. But each one gives them some kind of different ability, which I really like. I really like these little options that you can take like with Warhammer, you've got different um, loadouts that you can give your troops, and you can do the same here with uh, Confrontation, which I really like as well. So it gives the units a bit more replayability, replayability and they make it more situational for different things. I should have got that card. I should have got this card. Now, this is a French card, so I don't actually have ones in English. Maybe I can exchange this for some uh, some French player out there who has the English version that they can kindly send to me, but uh, and I can exchange it for this one. But yeah, we've got the stats on here anyway. The the abilities uh, I can I can Google Translate, but some of them you can probably see from what they are already. Uh, but I can I can also go to the to one of the websites that have all the cards listed on there that I can just check uh, online anyway. So it's no big drama. Uh, but yeah, the Thermal Rise, I really love these guys. I've got four of them, two of them are painted, and I'm just gonna touch up a couple little things just to make it similar to the studio studio version. It's not exactly the same as the studio version, so I wanna just change a couple little colors here and there today. Um, 
just so it matches. And um, and I've done I've I've redid all the bases so uh, the bases sort of match the original sort of studio scheme for those. I made a lot of the bases out of uh, natural uh, bark. Some guy here in one of the stores in Tokyo had a whole and just massive bags of. I think he works for a company that produce it. So I took some of those back. I sort of sliced them up into really really thin pieces and started using that as a way to make it more, they look more natural, I think. Um, and I quite like the effect of the, the bark for those. Some of them made with, like the Coros have the actual plaster, but plaster is so messy and it's such a, uh, it's, it's, a beautiful, it's a beautiful material to paint and to work with. And, and of course it makes the most natural looking rocks, but I just don't want to deal with the mess and um, having to make molds and all that kind of stuff for them and that kind of thing. Maybe one day I'll get back into plaster again, but for now I think the cork does a great job in um, in producing the bases for them. So uh, basically, like I said before, with the NAFTA weapons, they have these uh, boiler boiler technology. Maybe they've got you know their suits uh, are steam powered, and they have like some kind of boiler attached to the to the equipment. Um, that's giving them all these, uh, you know, st stat increases, maybe for their strength, maybe for their resilience, maybe for attack and that kind of thing. So every time you use, want to use these um, abilities and, and, and use, your, um, use your suit, you've got to make a roll. And if you roll a one, you've got to roll on this table. And if you roll a one again, well then it's killed outright. So there's a chance there, but sometimes, you know, that's not often the case. I as it's in French, I don't think I can make out the exact details of how many dice they get to roll. It doesn't really say, so I oh, will know anyway, he's got the card there at his place, so he knows exactly how that's going to work. But that's basically an overview of the dwarves and uh, what Owen's taking tomorrow. So we've got, uh, how many goblins have we got? We've got three, six, seven, seven goblins and we've got three, four, five, six of the dwarves. So we've got, we've got one over him, but the militiamen are not going to stand up against any of, what, of his troops. So I've got, I've got to focus on the, um, on the luck of the role of the reinforcements and try and get guys back on the table. Now, obviously, as you can see, there's a lack of terrain. <laughs> I've got no terrain on this board because uh, I think tomorrow we're just going to have it without terrain. And I think the first few games will have route without terrain. I am going to order some from that THM company. I think they're located in Canada, I believe, and they make some really nice resin terrain for confrontation themed on different armies and that kind of thing, which I really like. So I'm gonna grab a few pieces of that so I can paint up for the channel and that way you can have some really nice, you know, authentic looking terrain that sort of matches uh, what we're doing here. If, if yeah, obviously you can use trees, you can use you know fantasy buildings, anything you wanted to. I'm I'm looking for more of an authentic sort of look to the to the to the battles. So having that terrain will just enhance that authenticity to the game, and it'll make me it'll, it'll sort of you know immerse me into this world of I'm actually playing in the studio with one of the guys you know back in the day, and uh, having fun with all the all the all the studio models. Even though I'm not saying my models look anything like the studio models, those guys are incredibly gifted and talented. I'm just doing my best into trying to replicate the color schemes and the, and the feeling of, of those original models. Um, but yeah, we're gonna have fun tomorrow. I hope you guys can make it over to the Facebook group at uh, Confrontation Fanatics 3.5 if you can. It'll be at 7 a.m. or 7.30 a.m. Uh, tomorrow morning. Um, so uh, that's Tokyo time, and I think that's uh, I think that's like you know evening time or late afternoon in the U.S. and whatever whatever time it is in other parts of the world. But I'm gonna you know I'm, I'm gonna save it and I'm gonna upload it here as a YouTube channel so you can watch it later if you want to. But uh, hopefully that was a nice little introduction to the forces, not the rules. The rules will be covered in the video tomorrow, guys, so you can see how it plays. And you can see Ash's video on Guerrilla War Games too. If you look up uh, Confrontation there, you'll find it. But uh, hopefully that was a little bit informative for you. 
Um, maybe you do have your own collection of computation models that you're thinking about uh, taking out of storage and painting up and playing uh, with your friends. I'd really encourage doing it, just having a look at it again, just revisiting it, because it, it is a really special game and it's a massive part of, uh, that, that became the future of um, miniature war games. And, um, you know, think of like Privateer Press. I mean, they basically, you know, they basically evolved off the back of confrontation when they went when they went down to you know to supplement the loss of uh, the game in North America. So they basically took those ideas and just made um, their own game, their own system. Uh, and you know, look at Simon. Uh, you'll see a lot of the artwork and uh, aesthetics uh, based on confrontation and Rackham in a lot of their board games and that kind of thing because all those guys are from, all those artists are from uh, Rackham previously. Um, that they, they have formed their own company and they work with Simon now on a lot of their products and miniatures. So, uh, which is great to see those guys still still around and still in business and still doing their, um, still follow, following their passions and still working their craft because uh, they make the best stuff out there, I think. It's a shame it's all in plastic though. I really wanted my miniature, metal miniatures. So hopefully this new company that have the IP, is it Detour Games or something in France? Detour or something maybe. Um, hopefully they will come up with the goods, you know, get people their Kickstarter that they put money down on and give us our metal miniatures at some point because they are casting the metal. Uh, I think they were going to do it in resin at some point, but I think they changed their mind and did it in metal. They're going to do both. I don't. I'm not sure. I wouldn't touch um, resin if you paid me, but um, that's just my point of view on it. So metal miniatures. Hopefully they'll they'll recast them, and we'll have uh, a whole new line of range of miniatures available to us again that we can uh, start buying and, and painting and playing again. So who knows? We'll see what's going down in the future. But uh, yeah, stay tuned for the video, guys, tomorrow when we play Confrontation and, and we'll resurrect it from the ashes. Okay guys, take care. See you in the next one.